Hi everybody, welcome back. Well, because of the outpouring of comments I got from a lot of you viewers concerning this receiver, I've decided I am going to do a second video on it. But I'm not going to do it the way I normally do my restoration videos, because um, I really want to get this finished up and off the bench and get to some other things. But there were so many questions that I felt I probably should at least address some of those things. Of all the comments that I received from all of you, I can kind of break them down into one, two, three, four, five, six different things that seemed to be common threads of what everybody was asking. So I'll try to clump those together into six different questions generally and then try to answer them. And then we'll try to do some of those things here on camera. So, and none of this is in, in any order, it's just how I jotted them down on my piece of paper here. But the first one was the repair I made to the back of these boards. And if you go back to the video, we had to, I ended up replacing these MT200 style transistors with a set of TO3 PL transistors. And you can see they're different. This one has one mounting hole in the middle. This one has two mounting holes, one on either side. And I made an adapter. And you can go and back and look at that. But on one of the boards, the one that had these NEC, these Nippon transistors, these are the original ones that came with the unit. The other channel, the transistors had failed on them. And they replaced them with these excellent Sankin transistors, which are still good, by the way. I just removed them to make sure we had consistency. Both channels were the same. These are great transistors, but bottom line, uh, whoever replaced this must have had some difficulty removing the old transistors from the board, and they pulled up and broke off the tracks, the traces, to the back of the board, so we had to fix the traces. Uh, I think one viewer mentioned about using bus wire which is like this type of stuff you can buy. And all it is is just tinned solid copper wire. And you can use a piece of that and you can wrap the wire around this, you know, because these mount this way and the, the traces of the board are this way. And you just wrap the wire around that and then run it to the other end of the trace and then just solder across it and kind of make a bridge there. And that works really well. Uh, the method I used was the copper foil, which is just this stuff that you can buy at a home center or at a craft store. Solid copper sheeting. It's just the right thickness. When you uh, cut a piece off, I have a little strip here. It just, it actually looks like copper strip from a circuit board trace. And the way I do it, uh, I was asked what type of adhesive did I use to fix it down to the board. I didn't. Um, you can buy a copper foil tape. It looks similar to the Kapton tape, but it's copper. And you can stick it over there. But I, the adhesive doesn't really work well when you solder on it. It kind of releases and so forth. So what I do is I cut the strip to the right size, poke the two holes on either side, lay it on there and I put one end in, I, I first tin what's left of the old trace. I clean it off real well, polish it, rough it up a little bit and then put some solder and some you know, flux pen or something like this on there. And then I put the trace piece that I cut on top of there, I heat it up and it kind of fuses together with the, the thin tinning of solder underneath there. Then I'll flow the top of the one joint over while, with the pin through it, you know, of the component. Then the other side, I'll put the other component in and then flow it all the way across and just make it consistent. And it looks like you saw in the picture. That's how I do it. Everybody has their own little method of cleaning or repairing broken traces. And that's mine. That's how I do it. Among other things, it depends on how badly damaged it is, too, and what application you're using it for. But I hope that answers that. The next question that came up had to do with the transistor HFE, or transistors 
forward current gain of these outputs that I used. Uh, there's three different transistors that were involved in this video, right? We had the original NECs right here. We had the Sankins right here. And then we had the MJ, which is the one that I used. And if you look them up, the data sheets can be a little bit confusing, but I'll show you what the data sheets say. I had them print, I printed them out. I, you can Google search the data, just type in 2SD745 data sheet, and you'll come up with this. Uh, so here is NEC, the, these Savantec, or Savantic, they make uh, original replacements. These are the same as the NEC transistors. They have a little bit different case. They have the, the encapsulated case like this, whereas the NECs had the uh, exposed tab case on it. A little bit different, but same specs. And if you look at the gain on it, right there. So your small signal current gain, even though they don't say that, <laughs> HFE1 for the for the original NEC transistors they said that the minimum would be a gain of 20 they do not give you a maximum or a typical it's just the way they rate this and then HFE2 which is this is a power transistor so the current gain with a load on it and they're testing it at 2 amps of collector current with a VCE of five volts, and the five volts really doesn't matter. If it's a little bit higher than that or lower, it's really still gonna, this is all gonna be pretty much the same. And uh, you can see the range of gain that you can have in this transistor is anywhere from 40 up to 200, and they are gain sorted transistors. So if you get one with a, and I think I said all this in the video, I, I, but I got a lot of questions that people said, what's, you never said the gain of the transistor. So, uh, looking at this one, 2SD745, and then you see the letter R there. I don't know if you can see that. And that would be a gain of somewhere between 60 and 120. Now, here's, here's where this can be a little bit confusing. If you look at the, so here's another one made by uh, InChange Semiconductor. I believe these ones may even still be in production. Uh, it's a, I think this is a Chinese company. They make kind of knockoff versions of these transistors. And when I say that, I don't mean that they're counterfeit, fake, bad ones. It's just they're aftermarket ones. Some of them are very good quality. Some of them are not. It depends on the manufacturer that makes them. That's another question here. We'll get into that later. But if you go to the 2SC, 2921, which would be the mate to this 2SA1215, you can see that the data sheet is very different from this one, even though that, that was a replacement that was in here. If you look at this one, it says HFE with 4 volts and 5 amps instead of 5 volts and 2 amps, and they're saying it's going to be a 50, a minimum of 50. And it's also gain sorted, and they have a 50 to 100, 70 to 140, and 90 to 180. So if you really look at it for what it is, it's from 50 to 180 for theirs, but that's with these settings. Why is that all important? Well, I actually did another video, and I never released it on this. I haven't released it. I don't know if I'm going to, but I got into real detail. I used the, the triplet transistor analyzer and applied full current to these things and show could and I'm showing you how these work. But when you're running these big transistors with low collector current, you can see the gain, whatever the gain measures at low current, whether it's a you know measuring out at you know 50 or hundred or something, you can see that it's relatively flat gain from you know, 20 milliamps all the way up to about one to two amps.
But once you get about two amps in there, you go beyond two amps, the gain starts dropping rapidly. And that's why a data sheet isn't always super accurate because this one is showing right at two amps. And if it has a similar curve to this transistor, that means that you're reading in its you know more linear gain region right here. And it really start doesn't start tapering off till after two amps. But when you get to this one here, they're measuring it at five amps. See that? And of course, if you look at look at this chart at five amps, at five amps, there's two amps, three amps, four amps. See how much it drops? So it can be different. <laughs> so when you just ask what is the HFE of the transistor, I'm going to ask you under what conditions. Okay, that's typically not something you would worry about when you're looking at little transistors like these. You see these little tiny signal transistors, they don't run at high current and although they're subject to the very same things that the big transistors are, they operate more like this. So when you say the gain is a certain thing on them, they're, it's pretty close. With a power transistor, not so much. If you put high current on that transistor, it can drop. And if you look at this one, and I know I'm getting real deep into the weeds with some of this, but you need to know this. If you don't know it, you're not going to be able to do this sort of stuff. You know, you're going to get misled. But you can see this one, they don't even measure it at 2 amps. They give you the DC current gain at 8 amps, and at 16 amps. And of course, they're saying at 8 amps, this thing will have between a gain of 25 and 75, which makes it appear, if you just look at the, at the raw numbers, it would make it appear like this is a bad replacement because you have between 40 and 200 for this one and only 25 to 75 in this one. It's, this is junk, right? Wrong. As you, if you check this at a much, I mean, look, you put 16 amps through the collector of this, it's down to a gain of only eight. It has almost no gain. But if you check this at small signal, you know, real small signal, you might find that that gain is higher. Okay. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. And with this one, it's showing at very low current, it drops off as well. So, you know, this one does a little bit better at very low current, you know, the 2SC 2921 than the original 2SD 745s. I don't want to confuse you all with this stuff. But what I'm saying is data sheets can be misleading because they don't always test everything at the same test. You would have to set up a, you know, piece of test equipment and simulate the exact same voltages and currents both at the base and the collector and the volt, you know, collector voltage and all that to really compare these transistors. And even at that, they may kind of separate in how they perform uh, at high current, but in the current range that you'll be using them here, they may be very close to one another. And that's the case with this thing. You have to understand this is an 80 watt amplifier. And if you take 80 watts across an 8 ohm speaker load, the current is going to be somewhere between 3 and 3.5 three and amps. So this thing's never going to really operate greater than 5 amps. And you might say, oh, the transients and all that. Well, not really so much. It's still not going to get up to, to 5 amps in this, in this particular circuit. And so this transistor and this transistor and this transistor will all work in a very, very similar manner in that circuit, regardless of what the data sheets are saying, because again, the data, well, the data sheets are not lying. It's just that the test points that the, the test parameters that they're using are different. So probably confuse the crap out of some of you and others of you might be saying, aha, I get it. Uh, long story short, you know, if you want to learn how to do this for yourself, you have to know that sort of thing and how to read the data sheets and how to compare the data. Whereas 
if you just want to randomly replace one transistor with another, I would just suggest you go on to the forums like Audio Karma or something and just ask someone what they used and what would work. Okay, the next one is I hear a lot of back and forth comments about fake, quote unquote, fake components, fake transistors, uh, things from China, things from uh, AliExpress, things from eBay. So what's my thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts aren't as direct, you know, direct matter of fact as a lot of people when they give their thoughts. You have the camp of people who say all tr modern tr big transistors like that that have that part number are fake and therefore none of them are any good. And you have other people that says I've been buying these things from China for years and they work fine. What makes these two parties have such differing opinions? Well, the bottom line is there are modern semiconductor manufacturers overseas, at least from me it's overseas, like in Asia, like China and so forth, that do manufacture modern transistors to the specs of some of the older ones and they will use the part number of those original transistors. So for instance this one, this 2SD745, this is not I mean, the NEC factory has not been making 2SD745s for eons, you know, it's been a long time. But that doesn't mean that this transistor is not, in fact, a 2SD745 in specification. If this transistor with this signifier on it has the same performance specs like this, of the original one that was being made in the 1980s, then for all intents and purposes, it should be perfectly okay to use. The problem you run into is that some transistors uh, may not be made the same. You know, I can show you an example here. These are both marked 2N3055, and unfortunately, I had an original Motorola, one of the old first gen ones and one of the later versions and I don't know what the heck I did with it. They're getting hard to find those ones but this one was it says it has the Motorola insignia on it. I don't think it is a Motorola. Uh, I think this one here is a counterfeit but it may be able to withstand 115 watts of di heat dissipation and it may have the same you know, current and voltage ratings as a genuine 2N3055. What I do know is this case is not was not attached very well to the base. It just popped right off with a hobby knife revealing the underneath. Now when you look at the way this thing's built, you know, here's the die. This is the actual transistor. And there's your bonding wires, one here and one there. So your base and, and emitter and then the collector is actually the back part of this die that's fused to this metal heat spreader plate. And you can see how tiny the insulator is in here. So that insulator between the pin and the collector is just that tiny little black area there. You can see how close the bonding wires are to shorting out. <laughs> they might even be shorted out because I had this thing apart. Uh, but that being said, this may perform like a regular 2N3055. If you look at a real Motorola one from the old days, it looks nothing like this. The, the bottom plate is much thinner or thicker. The, you know, it's like real thick on the tabs and then it thins out in this area. The heat spreader inside is thicker than this, a little bit bigger. Uh, the insulators on either side of here are much wider. It's just a much better crafted transistor. Doesn't mean that they're, they both can't handle the same specs. Just means that this one is not built to the same spec. Here is one by ON or ON Semiconductor. This is a very reputable company. This one came from a reputable dealer that is ISO certified. So I know this is a real 2N3055G by ON Semiconductor. And you, there's no way, the way this thing's welded on here, you can't pop the top cap off of it. I had to cut it with a Dremel. And when I did, this is what it looks like. 
and you can see the insulator is much bigger the heat spreader plate is a little bit larger mass goes all the way to the edge there uh, you can see the die is actually different this one's a little bit smaller if you look this has a little bit physically larger die I don't know if I can zoom in without going out of focus but if you look this one has a little bit larger die than this reputable one so I don't know what that means but you can see the bonding wires are a little bit different they're slightly different but you may plug these two transistors into the same circuit and they may work exactly the same there's no knowing I mean I can't tell by looking at this die <laughs> what the differences would be between them uh, I can only see the physical size is a little bit different I can see that the case type and everything is different they're different transistors that may have the same specs and that's all I'm saying about it uh, when you purchase something the part number hopefully means that it will work but it may not one of them may be inferior I don't know and that's all I'm gonna say about it so when people say that beware of counterfeit transistors just understand some of them are and that doesn't mean they won't work but it also doesn't mean that they will so you know give each other a little bit of slack okay if you if the company you buy the transistor from is a reputable company you want to look at things like ISO 9000 you know series certifications and things like that there are different companies third-party companies out there independent companies that can certify your your business that you're selling and and buying and selling legitimate parts when you buy it from a place like that you can, you can have pretty good confidence that you're going to get a good part if you're buying it randomly from an unknown vendor online somewhere and I don't even care if it's eBay or, or AliExpress any place online and you don't know their background then you can't be a hundred percent sure you're going to get an authentic part just know that outside markings don't always mean everything Okay, the next question was about you know how I did the bias adjust. I had several comments where I think people I didn't show enough of it, so you may have kind of filled in the gaps in your mind what I did or didn't do, but I'll go through the procedure with you. First of all, the service manual on this is pretty readily available. I think you can get it. I know you can get it from uh, Hi-Fi Engine if you or you're a member there. But there's plenty of other places if you if you go on the search engines and look look up STA 2080 service manual it's it's not a deep dark secret there's a lot of that stuff out there and it says the way you calibrate it is you connect your meter across these emitter resistors let's look on the schematic real quick and I'll show you where that is so here's a picture okay this is one of the channels and these are the output transistors you see the little dotted line around there tells you that that's on the heat sink and if you look coming off of the emitter of the NPN you have this 0 0.047 or 0 0.05 resistor depending this one's at 0.5 no, 0 0.5 I'm sorry and uh, there on the emitter of the PNP there's another one and that's these are called your emitter resistors they join together at the speaker terminal so the speaker actually connects right where those two resistors join and then they reference this center point to ground and on either end each transistor has its own separate power supply one is a positive power supply one is a negative power supply and they're equal and opposite so if you put the exact amount of same amount of power on each side the same voltage they will cancel each other out so if I have for instance if I have 20 volts on this emitter and 20, negative 20 volts on this emitter positive 20 volts plus a negative 20 volts equals zero volts so this center part will be zero so the idea is when you turn the bias of the transistors on 
you want to get past that little 0.7 volt drop here till these transistors just start to conduct between the collector and emitter. Once you do that, there will be a certain voltage drop across this resistor and this resistor. It will be a tiny voltage drop because it's such a small uh, resistance. It's, it's a half of an ohm. And as long as they're equal and opposite, you should have still have zero volts here even though current is flowing between this line right here, across this line here. And the voltage drop, if you measure it from here to here and use Ohm's law, you can determine how much current is flowing. So basically they traditionally make you measure across one of the resistors so you don't have to worry about the two resistors being different resistances and all that. And um, you just you take the voltage drop which is going to be they want 10 millivolts. 10 millivolts across a half of an ohm is 20 milliamps and so they're saying 20 milliamps of idle current. Now some people get really hair splitting about that. They want it to be right on that. But what I found is in these types of circuits, these push-pull complementary and even quasi-complementary circuits like this, that that idle current is usually set to a high num a higher number than it has to be because if these transistors are a little bit mismatched, if these resistors are a little bit mismatched, if the the gain on the transistors isn't necessarily high enough or whatever, they know that if you set that voltage drop across this resistor, these will always be turned on enough that you will not get crossover distortion. And that's really what they're trying to get around. When, when these transistors drive, and I've gone over this a million times, but I know I get questions if I don't go over it again. When you have your positive half cycle of your sound, you know, your signal, this transistor is going to start conducting more and more. and it, through this center tap down into the through the, re, the speaker and to ground and eventually this one's going to turn off more and more until it totally turns off. Then what's going to happen is as the signal goes down and crosses the zero crossing and starts going to a negative half cycle this one's going to start turning on more and more. This one will turn off until finally it shuts the whole way off and then this one's going to carry the signal negative through here, through here, through the speaker to ground. And it just alternates back and forth like a seesaw. <laughs> and the idea is you never want one transistor to shut off before the other one fully turns on. Uh, and that's what this bias spreader is all about. It makes them both turn on enough that you have a nice kind of a nice crossover area where both transistors will be on for a little while before this one lets go and this one takes it all. And so if these are well matched and these resistors are perfectly matched and everything else then you could turn that way down to a lot less than that and it'll still work and the amp will idle much cooler. But you have to know what you're doing. You have to be able to measure the crossover distortion on a scope and so forth and look at the distortion on a distortion analyzer. But if you don't have that type of test equipment, follow the book. If you set this to, to 20 milliamps of idle current, it, you're never going to have to worry about that as long as the transistors are not defective. And they can be, you know, wherever they are, <laughs> even if they're a little bit mismatched, it really doesn't matter in this application. Um, it's hard to find a PNP and an NPN that are going to be gain matched anyway. Usually uh, the one will, will be higher gain than the other. It's just the way because of the way they make transistors. So don't worry about it. Okay, I hope that answers it. But all I did was I clipped my meter across this resistor here and here, set my, and then adjusted the pot, which is, where is it? Right here. I adjusted this pot until I read 10 millivolts across that resistor. That's it. Simple as that. Okay, next question. Uh, I had several comments. How do you adjust the VU meters? 
Well, the VU meter adjustment on this particular amplifier is on the speaker protect board over here, kind of next to the protect relays. So if you look down a little bit closer, that's these two pots here for the left and the right channel power meter. I, I call it, the, I just said VU meter because the comments they were saying VU, but it's the power meters, okay? Uh, volume units is different. You, you see a volume unit meter typically on a tape deck or something like that, but a, these are power meters. And no matter what manufacturer it is, it's typically a very similar process. All the meter is doing is it's measuring the voltage drop or the voltage that's being applied across the load, in this case the speaker, and it's just representing it on that scale of the meter for how many watts because of Ohm's law. And we know that, and if you look at these meters, I don't know if this one says it or not, but most of them, let's see what it says. These ones don't say. A lot of them where it says, you know, watts right in here, and you can't see because it's all the reflections, but it'll say watts, 8 ohms, for instance. Some meters will have two scales. They'll have an 8 ohm scale and a 4 ohm scale. And the reason is, as the speaker load impedance changes, the, the accuracy of that meter will change. So what you're going to find out is if you connect this stereo to a 4 ohm speaker, these meters will not read the correct wattage. They'll read, they'll actually read half of what they should. And it's because of Ohm's law. I hope that makes sense to all of you. There's nothing fancy about these. Now there are meters that have really elaborate metering circuits that can track like that, but you're not going to see that in the average stereo, especially this type of generation and this type of equipment. This is just simply a voltmeter that bounces around and measures the volts. It's checking the RMS voltage and then just show it. it and the scale is written based on an 8 ohm load. So now that you understand how that works, let's go through the process of how to set it. Now in order to do this correctly, you need two pieces of test equipment for 100%. You have to have it. One is a meter that's capable of reading true RMS. And you want it and you want it to be able to read true RMS up to the frequency that you're going to be testing. Most amplifiers they set the meters at one kilohertz. So you're going to put a one kilohertz signal into the amplifier, drive that one kilohertz signal into a set of speakers up to a certain voltage and you're going to want to measure that AC voltage and it has to be, uh, the meter has to be able to accurately do that. Some of the cheaper digital meters that you buy, when you get up around one kilohertz or above one kilohertz, they can lose accuracy. Now most of them, I mean even the cheapest, you know, Harbor Freight meters usually will read AC voltage pretty accurately as long as you're reading a sine wave, not, not any kind of strange where you need a true RMS meter. But you can read a, just a straight sine wave uh, up to about one kilohertz and it should give you an accurate measurement. Um, better meters, more expensive meters can read, you know, into the tens or even hundreds of kilohertz or sometimes even up into the megahertz and be still, still be accurate. But Suffice it to say, we're working with one kilohertz. Uh, if you have a, a meter, even a lower cost one, it'll work just fine. The other thing you're going to need is a signal generator. You have to generate that one kilohertz signal. Now, this is a kit that I bought from eBay and put together. And then I stuck a battery pack that just holds a bunch of AA batteries to give you the 12 volts you need or whatever it's supposed to be. I think it's 12 volts. This holds eight AA's and it has a convenient little switch. It, I bought this off of either Amazon or eBay already assembled like that and I just velcroed it to the back of this little kit and the kit even came with a plastic case and you can assemble these things 
and if I turn it on, it's nothing fancy, but it can, and you can see I can set this to one kilohertz sine wave, and if I hit this middle button, it'll turn it on, and then I can set the amplitude with this knob here, and come out of the output into the auxiliary input of my amplifier, and that'll give me my one kilohertz. If you don't have a signal generator at all, I highly recommend you invest in something like this. These can be had for you know, 30 bucks, give or take. And there's many, many, many different versions. Some of them are pretty junky and they don't work very well. The, and you can get those for like 10 bucks. Go for the little bit more money and get the nicer one. Um, the, you know, this one has the dual outputs and so forth for high frequency and for low frequency and so forth. I mean, this won't do RF or anything, it's just for audio, but it works great and it's cheap. So you need those two things. Let's hook it up and we'll go through the process. All right, so here's the setup. I have two ridiculously large resistors here. They're 8 ohm dummy load resistors. You can also buy these little ones. These are good for up to 100 watts if you put them on a, you know, a piece of metal like a piece of aluminum for a heat sink. That's a lot smaller. Uh, and I just have them connected. This resistor is connected to the right channel. This one's connected to the left channel. And that's all we're doing is we're measuring the voltage across that resistor. This resistor is pretending to be the speaker. And whatever voltage drop there is across this resistor that's going to be used to calculate how many watts is being dissipated by the resistor or would be by the speaker if that was in there. Now, I also have this connected to the auxiliary input. So you just come out of the signal generator. I just have a splitter here so I can drive both channels at the same time if I want, but I could also just connect one wire and drive the left channel and then drive the right channel. And again, it's very easy to measure what our output is. So I'm going to turn this on like so. And then I'm just going to set it to, to run. And I'll turn this up here in a little bit. And then I have the meter. I'm going to set it to AC volts. I'm just connecting it across the resistor. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this down so you can see the meter and everything while I make the adjustment and make the measurement. We're going to put the meter down here close to it and see if we can get everything in video. So the first thing we have to determine is how many volts RMS is equal to 10 watts because we want to set our meter to 10 watts, right? So it's a pretty simple formula. Voltage equals power time, the square root of power times resistance, or the square root of PR. So all you do is we take, let me see if I can be in camera here, you take 10 watts times 8 ohms is 80. Take the square root of that, and you want about 8.94 volts. And I'll give you another little trick, the rule of eights. It, 8 volts RMS into an 8 ohm load is going to be 8 watts of power. So if you don't have a calculator handy and you can you know where 8 watts is on the meter there, you could set it that way too. But we need about 8.94 volts, which is real close to 9 volts. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to turn the volume up. And remember, I have the dummy load on the speakers, terminals, and I have the meter reading across the dummy load. Let's turn this up now. And you can see how the meters are moving. And since this is a detented knob, I can't get it perfect, so I'll use the output of the signal generator to get it right on 10 watts. And you can see that is not reading properly, is it? 
Oh, I'm not on 10 watts, that's why, idiot. I'm on one watt, here we go. There we go, 10 watts. And you can see that's not set right. It's saying 10 watts and they're saying 12.5 volts. And we want 8.9 volts. So that means it's set wrong. So what we want to do is we're going to take this down to about 8.9 volts. See, I'm going to just measure it till it says just about 8.9 something volts. There we go. That's pretty close, right? 8.94, 8.94. And then all I'm going to do now that I know I'm putting out 10 watts into that resistor, and these resistors will get hot if you have too small of a resistor. And I'm just going to turn this down or up until I get 10 watts. So there we go, we got 10 watts there. And then I'm going to go to this one. And I'm going to go to 10 watts there, and that pot is a little bit dirty. So I better spray it with something. And there you go. So if it's too jumpy, we might have to clean the potentiometer, and I can spray it with some contact or with some control cleaner. But there it is, now it's 10 watts, we're good. And this resistor is ice cold because we're really not driving, you know, this is a 300 watt resistor and I'm only putting 10 watts into it so I could sit, it could sit there all day and it won't hurt it. The meters are set, that's all there is to it. You just adjust it to be the wattage that it's supposed to be. And you can see we're on the 10 volt scale using just an analog meter. And there's 8 volts. This dash right here is 9. We're just before it. And it's right on. Same thing. So you could use either the analog or the digital and it will work. So just for fun, let's try the rule of 8s. If I go to 8 volts, I should have 8 watts. So it should be just before that number 10, right? So let's get in a little bit closer so you can see. I'm going to just use this. I'm going to set it as close to 8 volts as I can. And I'm going to have to adjust the signal generator again because of the detented volume knob. If I go right on that 8, looks pretty close. And you can see I'm just on the left of the 10 watt scale there. And because this is a logarithmic meter movement, <laughs> There's not very much accuracy. You can see <laughs> the all the meter movement between one one watt and a hundred watts is just that tiny little bit there, and it's just the way these power meters work. They're more for eye candy than anything else. This is not really a highly accurate piece of you know gear. You they they're there to look look good. Okay, the last one is a little bit more difficult to answer because uh, every now and then I get some viewers who don't understand or are not pleased with because what they wanted and what the video contained were two different things and then rather just saying, well, this is not the video I wanted to see, I'll go look another place. They want to go on and insult you and say that you're, you know, you're stupid or you're your clickbait or the, they use all kinds of names and things and they get all frustrated with themselves and upset and angry and I'll read this one because I'm not really sure what it means because of the wording but maybe you know it says uh, if you don't plug it in and this was from this video that I did on this unit here he said if you don't plug it in you can't destroy it it's an old saying going back to the ancient times, and then there was like a blue smiley face emoji, and he he misadjusted it. Oh, not that much of an engineer. Why was the calculation not done in correlation with the schematic and the parts used and the resistor on R465 over the adjustment of VR901? 
But if other people don't adjust it, man, oh man, then they are the worst people. Double standards. Well, nice, nice. That sure will give joy to the people in the hobby to tell them they are bad, not doing the calculation what the engineer thought 40 years ago. That's a crime. I, ex I think that's expected it to be spot on the first time by the calculation and the professional gear in the background that, oh, maybe other people don't have that. The better people, they know everything better. Now, first of all, I'm not angry and I'm not taking offense to anything. Um, this, you know, I've had this person make comments on a couple of my videos and I'm not calling him out, but I'm just trying to understand him a little more and maybe offer some help if I can. But first things first, and that is that not every video that everybody does is going to exactly be what you expect it or want it to be. And you can't expect people to change who they are or what they do uh, based on what you particularly want. Now, I don't believe this person to be a troll or one of those derogatory terms, but I do think this person is somewhat frustrated. I don't know where he's from. Um, or if this has been a, a you know translated or something you know not written in English and so again I try to give everybody the benefit of the doubt and I think this is frustration going back a few of my other videos he commented on similar types of things like this I think what he's trying to say is he, that he doesn't understand what I'm doing and that I'm not portraying it in a manner that someone of you know, beginner skill level or something can understand. And I tend to agree with that sometimes because some of these videos are really not intended for the absolute beginner. And I did make some prefaces at the beginning of some of my videos, especially the transistor substitution. You need to know some things like Ohm's law and how it works and different things before this video will make sense. And I, I try to put that, make that comment on videos where they're going to be a little more advanced. Other times, I may just do a video in a way that you don't relate to it. And a, a lot of people do that. I've watched plenty of videos that are like that. Um, if you don't like someone's style or you don't like the content that, th that you're watching, don't watch it. Um, this person said in the last video that he was unsubscribing and he made a very couple of derogatory remarks. And I said, if this brings that much rage and anger into your life, it makes you that frustrated, you should un unsubscribe. You don't want to put yourself through that. Um, you know, that, that was my comment on that, but obviously he did not unsubscribe. And, and I get the feeling he's just trying to learn and is getting frustrated. But let me give you a little sage advice on that, and that is, if you want to learn, you have to communicate with people. Not everything that everybody says is always understandable and if there's language barriers or if there's a you know kind of a big knowledge gap of the subject versus what you know about it then you, I understand you're not going to understand some things but myself and probably almost anybody on YouTube who makes these kinds of videos all of us are good people we try to, to we make these videos for you because we want to share what we know and we want to learn what you know too by sharing with one another. And so, you know, if you don't understand something, you can always ask me a question in the comments. I can't always answer everything and if it's really complicated, I won't answer it because it's kind of beyond the scope of what I can do in a YouTube comments section on a video. But if it's something, you know, like I think you said several videos back, you know, what is HFE? And I explained it. I typed, you know, actually responded to your comment. Um, I, I want to help if I can. And if I can't, that's fine too. But don't get mad at me. I mean, I have television channels that I don't like the content that they show. None of the shows interest me. I don't call the TV station and yell at them and tell, 
call them names and say bad things about them. I just don't watch the TV station. And what I found is if it's <laughs> something that many other people have in common that they don't watch it, they quit watching it as well, it's a self-correcting problem. That station will go away. And if I find that there's still a huge viewer rating for that television station, then maybe it's just me. Maybe it's something I don't like, but maybe it's not that bad. It's just not something I like. And that's fine too. I just don't watch it. But nothing like that in this world is worth that kind of anger towards other people. I think we get caught up in that stuff. You know, now I know there's trolls on the internet and their whole they they get off on annoying other people. And the best way for for to take care of a troll is not to feed them. <laughs> but that's a different thing. They have a set purpose to do that. But I don't I am a person who doesn't believe that there are very many people like that out there. I think the general population, even people who make negative comments and things are just frustrated or don't understand something or don't understand you and that's where it comes from and if that's the case well I'm sorry that I couldn't get through you know couldn't teach in a better way or whatever but again if there's someone some other channel that helps you with that you should watch them I mean that's how you learn so again this is not about giving people a lecture or anything even though that's what I just did <laughs> in, a, in a way but it's my way of saying to all of you, um, don't perpetuate this. If somebody makes a negative comment, I know the first knee-jerk reaction is you want to jump in there and either come to my defense or add your opinion to it. And it just feeds fuel into the fire. It's not worth it. If we can help one another, we try to help one another. If someone's going to be a total troll, then yeah, we're just going to ignore it and move on. But if, if it's genu genuinely we see that someone's struggling to learn or something, a little bit of sugar will go a lot f further in catching a fly than vinegar. <laughs> and so uh, I just want to say to you and to anybody, you know, if you don't know something, ask. If you don't like the content of a video, don't watch it. It's real simple. You know, you, you don't have to spend your life being angry over something that doesn't mean anything. This is a stupid video on fixing an old stereo from the 1970s. You know, uh, there's so many other horrible things going on in this world, you know, have been since the beginning of dawn of man, you know. But truth be told, we have enough things to make each other angry about, which, you know, this is so small potatoes let's turn it the other direction. Let's try to build one another up instead of tearing one another down. And again, I apologize to all of you for listening to this rant, but um, I hope you know where I'm coming from on that. I think it's important. It means something for me to be able to say that. And uh, again, if you don't like the rant, skip it. Skip through it. No problem. But I'll end this video the way I end all of them, and that is wishing all of you even you, peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And uh, hope everything goes well for all of you. Take care, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time. I'll try to get uh, some other things here on the bench that I need to get done. Take care. Bye-bye.